Let's talk to Mike Ingram. He's the Chief Market Strategist at WH Island. Very good morning to you, young Mike. Morning, Moose. Right, Goldilocks economy, non-farm, markets are all right when they know what's going on. Spring statement, CFTC, sterling, okay, um, net longs. Loads going on. You said, you, said it, you said it all. There's not much more I can add to You give me the answer. Right, so um, very interesting market reaction to the non-farm payrolls on Friday. So um, market's very pleased by the fact that we weren't seeing wage inflation uh, take off. We had that 2.9 number uh, coming out of uh, January, expected to ease back to 2.8, went to 2.6, yep. only 0.1 on the month. And at the same time, market expecting 200K adds 313, 54,000 upwards prior adjustments the last two months as well. So, you know, it, it, in principle, it put this Goldilocks scenario back on the table. It's like, you know, contained inflation um, and still like quite punchy growth coming through. Um, interesting to see. I mean, you can expect the bomb, the, 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 um, the equity market to respond uh, positively to that. And you definitely saw that on Wall Street and it pu pulled the rest of the, uh, the afternoon in Europe up by its bootstraps. But you continue to see rates um, come off because what you've seen from the Fed over the last uh, few weeks is continued hawkish testimony. You've had hawkish testimony from the new Fed chair, Jay Powell, to uh, Congress. Even the biggest dove on the FOMC, Lael Brainard, was saying, oh, the US economy is the mirror image of where it was two years ago when I was very hesitant to raise rates, um, which is rubbish, but you know that's that's the spin that she's putting putting on it. So at the same time, as I say, you, you, you know, even having banked this better, if in principle, inflation number, though I, I hesitate to say, we're gonna get to see a proper inflation print this week from the US, um, the market's still edged up. And this is the thing, is that the, the, the market is now confident that the Fed at least isn't behind the curve. That was the worry that the Fed was behind the curve and the, the rising rates, because we all know they're going up, yep. but the rising rates would be disorderly, disorderly. Uh, and by, by that it means the market doesn't know exactly when and where it's going, creates a lot of uncertainty, creates a bit of volatility, pushes risk premium into the markets, and you know, as, you, as we all know, markets do not like uncertainty. Everything yep. tends to suffer. So this this pro explains a little bit of what's uh, of what's going on. But I have to say that overall, you have to say that the U.S. economy is looking pretty good in terms of growth. Yep. Um, and the global economy is also looking pretty good in terms of growth. Spring statement, a couple of bullet points. Yeah, I mean, you saw Philip Hammond doing the old uh, treading the old boards yesterday. He was on Peston and Andrew Marr and so forth, and he. They said, look, your borrowing numbers for the for the year are going to come in lower. He acknowledged that. It's pretty obvious, probably between 7 and even £11 billion pounds better. What are you going to spend it on? Is it the national health? And he immediately stamped on that, saying, look, this is not a fiscal event. I don't want to go back to this twice-yearly jamboree of announcements. So really, um, this is about the OBR's new forecast, which will reflect those lowering spending numbers. They will also, by the way, reflect the impl uh, explicit costs of Brexit, that so-called divorce bill, it would be the first time the OBR putting in it. Um, I think we've had better productivity numbers over the last couple of quarters out of the UK, but having been wrong for, for years, literally about productivity, they were going to be very, very uh, wary of revising it back up after having only revised it back down in the November budget. Brexit number? Uh, Brexit number in terms of? Spring statement. Um, 38, 38 billion, but it may, I think you might have to dig deep to find it. Right. Because a lot of it's going to be pensions. That's going to be decades to come. OK, so before we finish, yeah. we've got to talk about sterling. Yes. You said off air, CFTC. Sterling's been the G10 currency that everybody's like, love to hate, really, in most of the post-referendum environment. And just to add, the Bank of America reports on UK equities are the most hated as well. Exactly. They're a big underweight for, for most institutional uh, investors, of course. The worry is of if any, anything positive on Brexit toast come through, a lot, there's a lot of people you know, perhaps looking to cover. But anyway, returning back to Sterling, um, you know, we, we, we clawed our way back up into a neutral position, more or less, in November. And going into the year, we've started to actually see, you know, small, small net longs. But over recent weeks, we've seen those tail off someone. This may well reflect the fact that, at least to my mind, you know, the rhetoric coming out of the EU27 regards the, uh, the, you know, the Brexit negotiation and ahead of this summit in Brussels later on this month is sounding pretty hawkish. And, mm. you know, it's, 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 the Irish border is proving to be a pivotal um, uh, situation. You saw uh, Leo Varadkar, the, uh, the uh, I'm not going to say the word, Irish Prime Minister, um, uh, uh, over the weekend, say, oh, well, you know, a hard border is unacceptable to us. And you're thinking, well, it's a decision on both sides, mate. Um, 
And, um, you know, that, that's going to be very, very hard for Tommy. As it stands at the moment, the, the, the non-agreement that we had in, uh, in December last year um, was basically, as I've said before, implies either a very hard Brexit or no Brexit at all. And, you know, I think the, the political reality uh, and to some extent the economic reality in the UK is neither of those scenarios are actually acceptable to us. So, you know, it's everything to play for. In the meantime, you know, uh, we're neutral, maybe going towards a, sh a short on sterling uh, in terms of market positioning. And as you said, equity market, people very, very wary indeed on the UK. So it's amazing how good the US currently looks, OK, in terms of, you know, you taking out some of the geopolitical risk with the North Korea situation, um, in terms of the non-farm payroll numbers outstanding, the, the, in terms of yep. the inflation with the 10-year money below 3%. So all looking very, very good, whereas we come back to the UK and obviously sterling looks as if it's under pressure in terms of the, the equity market, everyone's underweight, OK, and the, the politics just won't disappear, will it? Yeah, I mean... If you look at the current earnings season in the UK, it has been, you know, the FTSE 100 has been a disappointment overall. I mean, you look at, um, say, S&P 500, that was about a 4 4.5% beat on average. Uh, Euro stocks, about a 6% beat. I think on the Nikkei, you're getting towards a 10% beat. Um, but FTSE 100, 7% miss. Mm. You know, so, um, you know, you've got economic momentum in most of the rest of the world. You've got corporate earnings momentum in most of the rest of the world. Unfortunately, you're not tending to see it come through in the UK. And that's that's a fundamental justification for why people are quite wary about going into the UK uh, as a whole. And of course, you know, you'd argue there's a risk premium out there. We, we, the, the problem with, with the whole Brexit situation, as I said before, it's, it's never been about the economics. It's always been about the politics, but this is a political decision with economic consequences. And the problem is, is some of those economic consequences are very, are very bad for the UK. There's no doubt about. It. I mean, yep. you know, I'm not saying anything which anybody doesn't already know. Yep. The fact is, we're starting. We, we are seeing to some extent that some of that being manifest. But some of it's kind of mechanical. Some of this goes back to, you know, the devaluation of sterling immediately post referendum. You know, and we're still to some extent, certainly the consumer is still having to live with that. Finally, yes. as an economist, trade wars. Well, I don't agree with Trump in as much as they are they are good and they are easy to win. Um, I mean, I find the whole rhetoric around steel, um, for instance, as being utterly bizarre. So for instance, you know, China's net exports uh, are a five year low. I mean, they have been rationalizing uh, capacity, albeit rather slowly. I mean, this is China after all. Um, and it counts, I think, to something like 2% of the US's net imports. Yep. So, I mean, I think to some extent this falls into gesture politics. And of course, you know, initially it was going to be Mexico. Elections, and, right? Yeah, well, yeah, but again, you know, I, mean, I hesitate to rationalise anything that Donald Trump does. But, you know, one might think so. But, you know, given the attention span of most people in most things these days, why start that off in March when you don't have your midterms until November? I would have thought you'd do it a few weeks before that and then say, America first, America first, vote for me. Um, right, because by then, I mean, you know, Taylor Swift might have a new album out and there's no idea uh, in the summer. Um, and, you know, you might have another movie and he goes, oh, yeah, it's a Marvel movie or whatever. You know, you know everybody's attention span, they'll all have forgotten that, that, that Donald Trump started all this sort of thing. It, for me, it's, this is all about this, this whole idea about multilater multilateralism against bilateralism. You know, Donald Trump is very, very suspicious of these sort of multilateralism bodies like the United Nations. We've just about brought him on side in terms of NATO. World Trade Organization, he certainly doesn't like the look of. Um, so one of his first acts was to pull out the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Yeah, that's one of the first things he did in his presidency. Um, he's, he's, you know, he doesn't like the idea of NAFTA. What he likes is like, you know, as you say, bilater bilateral one-on-one -on -one negotiations. But of course, in that forum, the US is the biggest kid on the block. And let's be honest, Donald Trump is probably a little bit of a bully. On that note, Mike, we run out of time. Thank you very much indeed. Pleasure.